another day, another dollar. Thank the Lord for another 24. God, I knew that was you. Late night grind. Just get back to the crib from the gym, baby. Fitting the meal prep, man. Relax a little bit before I go back into work tonight. Quick correctional officer video. I'm covering. We're going to talk about some scary situations that you may encounter working in corrections. You know, if you're new to the scene, you about to start in corrections at your facility, you know. I've been a correction officer for 13 years. You know, I've worked at three different facilities, one county jail, two different federal prisons. The craziest shit I've, I've probably seen by far is when I was a rookie at the county jail. You know, I was, tw I was what, 21 years old. I'm still in college. You know, I had been probably a few months into the job, right? And I'm working night shift on the unit, man. And the inmate hung himself. And he left me. He left me to find him. You know, it was a crazy situation. You know, I'm working. It happened on the top tier. You know, if you look, uh, if you watched any shows or none, or you work inside corrections, you know, there's two stories in the housing unit where the inmates live at. So he did it on the top tier. You know, I'm making my rounds. I made my first round and counted throughout uh, uh, that night, right? And an uh, hour later, I was required to do my rounds on the hour, you know? So I go in the next time I do my round, you know? Everything check out, do the bottom tier. I got my flashlight, sign on my light mirror, making sure the inmates is cool. Then I go upstairs. I, I get to, I think he was like the fourth or fifth cell down on the uh, on the top range. So I get to, I do the first three, everything good. Then I get to this cell and I don't see him. I'm looking. I'm like, where the fuck is he? I look, you know, I look down. He was like sitting down right behind the door, you know, so I wasn't sure what he was doing at first. At first, I thought he was just reading a book or something, you know, but the lights were out and whatnot. So I'm like, okay. I knock on the door, his cell door and shit, no response. I'm like, uh, okay. So I knock again hard. I'm like, yo, hey, hey. You know, still no response. So the type, the way the unit was set up, you know, it's an officer that works up in the tower. They're in charge of hitting all the buttons. Everything is electric. You know, as far as it's automatic, the door, the cell doors are slider doors. So the officer up in the tower has to hit the button and the door slides open, you know. So I'm like, what the fuck going on, man? I'm looking. It's, it don't it don't look right. It don't feel right neither. You know, I'm a rookie. Like I said, I only got a few months on the job, man. But, you know, I have been working long enough to know when something just doesn't feel right. So I get on my walkie-talkie, you know, the officer and I uh, radio. I'm like, uh, I think I, I forgot what I said. What, smooth to... uh. A, a unit tower officer, can you roll this cell over here? I wave. They can see you. It's like plexiglass. You know, the officer up in the tower, they can see down in the unit, but the inmates can't see back up uh, at the officer. You know, they may be able to see their shadow sometimes. It's like a one-sided mirror. So they hit the button, and they rolled, the, the, the cell door rolled open. Soon as that mug opened and it rolled open, that motherfucker flopped out. Boom! He flopped out right in front of me. You know, he had a string. He took a shoestring or something. It was tied around his neck. It was like cinched into his neck. You could see where it had, where he, where he sat down. He tied it to the inside of the door somehow and sat down and hung himself like that. And it had cinched into his neck. He was blue in the face. He was gone. He was gone. There was nothing I could do. You know, like I said, I was a rookie. I didn't know what the hell to do, man. I had never seen nothing like that, you know. And I'm not going to lie to you. I panicked. I ran. I ran. His body was in front of me, you know, for me to get to the steps to get off the unit. His body was in front of me. I literally jumped over him and I took off. I ran down the steps and I ran out the unit. I was almost halfway up the hallway, you know, before I got my composure and I was able to get on my walkie talkie and call for medical assistance. You know, it was I had never seen nothing like that. You know, he had been dead probably. I don't know. 30, 40 minutes. Like I said, I was only required to do rounds on the hour. So an hour, that's enough time for anybody to kill themselves if they really want to. And it was crazy because he had been on suicide watch a few days before that. And you know, when somebody's on suicide watch, you take everything from them. The only thing they can have is like a green smock. It's like a, it's like a tear resistant smock. So they can't make any kind of strain to try to hang themselves with. And they're under constant 24 hour observation you know, by an officer or there's like special inmate companions, you know, that their, their, their job, they're trained by psychology, the psychologist department to sit there and watch the inmates. And you have to document every 15 minutes what the inmate is doing. You know, you can't move. You can't be reading a book. You can't be distracted. You have to just sit there. I've, I've done it plenty of times in my career. I have a suicide watch. 
you just sit there, you know, it's easy money, you know, but you have to think, you just have, you, you can't move. If you want to go, if you have to go to the bathroom or heat your food up, you have to call for an officer to come relieve you so they can sit there and do suicide watch till you get back. And then you got to just sit there the whole time. You get a, like a special log book and you have to document everything they do every 15 minutes, man. Take that serious because that could, could uh, potentially be used as a court document in the event that the inmate was to kill themselves on suicide watch. I'm sure some of y'all uh, been have heard uh, it would happen about two or three years ago where it was a billionaire, Jeffrey Epstein. He had committed suicide watch and he was on suicide watch, I believe, at the federal prison up in New York. That was a whole big fiasco, man. It was a lot. It, it, it brought a bad light on the agency, the Bureau of Prisons as a whole, man. You know, I think they made a lot of law change. They made a lot of policy changes. A lot of stuff came after that, man. It was like shit kind of rolled downhill. You know, so like I said, I ran and I finally got my composure. I see my uh, fellow co-workers, nurses, officers running up the hallway, you know, so I go back. I go back in there, you know, one of the officers get in there, they start doing CPR. You can hear the fucking, his, you can hear his bones crunching in his chest. You know, he was a uh, older man. The officer was kind of big. He was, boom, you can hear like bones crunching. I had never seen or heard or experienced anything like that a day in my life. You know, I almost contemplated quitting corrections. You know, I, was, I wasn't sure if this was the right career for me. I was like, you know, I don't know if I'm cut out for this shit. You know, I'm just, I was just being realistic with myself. I was, I had to do some soul searching. It kind of messed with me for like two or three weeks after it, the event occurred. You know, I had to talk to the state police. You know, it was at a county jail. The uh, state police comes in and investigates everything that went down. So I had to talk to the state police give my statement, you know, but I was, I mean, I, I had did everything within policy, you know, there's the door to the unit. When you open it, there's like a sensor. So it records every time the door opens or closes. So I was on, I was on the money with my rounds. It was nothing I could do. Like I say, an hour is a long time. If anybody wants to kill themselves, it probably only take maybe five, 10 minutes. You know, if you try to hang yourself before you check out, but you know, I ended up sticking with it. You know, that, that was like one of that was like my introduction to corrections, you know, I was like, I ended up in the end just sticking with it. Here I am 13 years today, you know, but just know working in corrections, no matter what facility, no matter what institution you go to, you're bound to see some type of action, man. It doesn't matter what security level, you could be at a camp, you could be all the way at a high security penitentiary. Anything can go down anywhere. I never put anything past i don't put nothing past nothing I, I you know i don't know when i go into work every day i don't know what i'm gonna get into that day or what to expect on the ship you know i done seen like i said i done seen it all man suicides i had to do cpr on the inmate that had two uh heart attacks and died in the shower i was able to save his life by doing the cpr you know that happened last year i done seen inmates get stabbed man blood everywhere man i remember uh, when I first started working at the feds, I was in West Virginia. This had happened around breakfast time. You know, we in there standing at main line. That's where the inmates go to chow, get their breakfast. You know, we every all the staff members that work night shifts, some of the day shift staff are, try, are starting to trickle in. It happened around maybe 6.30, almost 7 a.m. So they doing breakfast. We everybody standing there. Now, all of a sudden, uh, control comes on the radio. Control, uh, what they say, all available radio units, staff needs assistance in the kitchen or in the, uh, the dining hall. So we looking, we, we don't see nothing. So everybody run to the back. You know, as soon as we get there, it's blood everywhere. It looked like, it looked like, man, they have stabbed each other with uh, samurai swords or something. It, I'm talking about, it was blood all over the floor. It looked like a homicide scene. You had two Hispanic inmates going at it. I think one of the inmates had a lock in the sock. That's a weapon that inmates use in prison. You, you will learn about that if you, uh, once you get on the scene, you know, you look this up. You take, basically what an inmate does, they'll take a tube sock, a long tube sock, like, you know, a regular sock you put on, and they'll take a combination lock, and they put it in the tube sock, and now you have a weapon, an improvised weapon, and trust me, I've seen an inmate get cracked upside the head with a lock in the sock, lump like this on his head, man. Bow! You imagine you take a, two, a long sock, you know, and put a lock in there, wound it up, crack, pow, boom. 
I think the other inmate, he had beat the other inmate with a lock on the sock. It was blood everywhere. We got there. We trying to break them up. They still was trying to fight. They were still going at it, man. It was like, that was my intro to the federal prison system. You know, I think I, that was in my first, my rookie year working for the feds. I seen that happen. You know, uh, all kind of inmate fights. I done seen staff members get assaulted. I've seen all, man. But the number one scary uh, situation I feel like you may encounter in a prison by far, it's probably like a staff assault, a staff getting stabbed up, or, you know, a staff needs a medical emergency because you got an inmate on top of them. That's like the number one thing, in my opinion, you know. We've had altercations over the years in the federal prison system, and it's probably, it's happened at numerous prisons and jails around the nation where, unfortunately, we have lost officer lives in the line of duty. You know, they've either got assaulted, stabbed up by inmates, you know, and they, unfortunately, they didn't make it. You know, we had one instance at a federal prison in Pennsylvania. You know, you can look this up. The inmate stabbed the officer like a hundred and something times with a shank, man. And it was like, they, he had no, he had, he didn't have a fighting chance. He was going to lock down the unit. The other two, the last two inmates that were out, they, they pushed him down the steps. He fell on the steps before he can even recover and regain his balance to defend him. So they were on top of him, man. The one, uh, he stabbed, like I said, he stabbed him about a hundred times. You know, he, they didn't find, I think they, I read some of the details of what happened. They said they didn't find him till like maybe 30 minutes later or something. The other officer from the other unit that they worked side by side, he came over, I think to do count and he seen him there. And you know, it, it was a lot out of that, man. That's That was one of the reasons for the uh, the feds, the BOP, that was one of the reasons why we got staff proof vets. They made it mandatory upper management that every institution uh, from a low security all the way up to a high security penitentiary has to wear a vest. And that's why they made it to where we could carry OC, you know, just a safety precaution. But yeah, staff assault, that's one of the most serious deals right there, you know, because the number one priority, you know, when you're a correction officer working in this type of environment is staff safety making sure everybody comes in, how they uh, go home, how they came in. That's the number one bottom line. Or everything else, nothing trumps that, you know. So if you work in the unit, you work in the side, and control comes on the walkie-talkie, they say staff needs assistance, uh, body alarm in such and such unit or such and such area, you need, if you're not in charge of directly supervising inmates, you if you're in charge, if you're supervising inmates, you know, you obviously... You can't leave that area. You know, you have to stay there with the inmates. But if you're not and your job is to respond to that emergency, you need to be doing everything you can to book it as fast as you can to get to that scene to help your coworker out. You know, you may just be the first responder. You may just be the difference between your coworker going home, you know, safely to their family or them having to go out in the body bag and the warden the captain or the associate warden having to call their family and notify them that unfortunately their family member is not going to be coming home tonight, you know? So when you have a staff assault, staff needs assistance, comes across the walkie talkies, uh, all available radio units, we got a body alarm, such and such area or such and such unit, you need to be booking it as fast as you can get there. Like you're running in a track meet, man. You know, I don't hold back. When I'm trying, if you got you got to think too. Now the prison is big. You may have to run from the bottom of the prison all the way to the back of the prison. The rec yard may be in the back of the of the prison. That could be like the length of two football fields. You have to be able to run there, you know. And then when you get there, you have to be able to perform your job, you know. Get the inmate off your coworker. Fight off other inmates that may be trying to attack your coworker. You know, you have to keep those things in mind. That's why it's important. You know, to make sure you do some type of physical activity, you know, and be in uh, pretty decent shape to the best of your ability. You know, I feel like you need to be in top notch shape to do this job just for the simple fact that the inmates work out every day. The inmates are in there getting it. I see it on a daily basis. Some of these jokers, you know, I like to work out. I've been working out lifting weights 21 years. I'm a former college athlete. I played college football. I still keep up with it and work out seriously. But these dudes, they are... It's like a religious to them too. You know, I treat working out like a religion, like a lifestyle. These dudes get in here, man, you got some jacked inmates. They work out like seven days a week, you know? So you need you need to prioritize some type of physical training, going to the gym, jogging, something, you know? So you're in shape in order to perform the job to the best of your ability, you know? 
Other stuff you may encounter, I, I mentioned some already, you know, an inmate getting stabbed, an uh, uh, inmate fight, stuff like that. You know, if you're working on the unit and you have, you know, you sitting there and all of a sudden inmates start fighting, you know, your job, you need to get on the walkie talkie and, and, and relay to control what's going on in your unit. You know, be specific. Uh, for example, A3 unit to control. I got an MA fight on my unit. If they got knives or uh, improvised weapons, they got like a broomstick, they got a shank, they got a lock in the sock, something like that. Relay that, relay that to control. Uh, MA weapons involved, you know, so people that's responding to the scene, they know what they're getting into. You know, they keep fighting. You tell them to stop fighting, but they keep fighting. You know, you whip out your pepper spray, you end up spraying both of them. You don't try to remember to get on your walkie talkie and relay that to control too. OC has been deployed. I got an MA fight on the unit. Uh, OC has been deployed. So people know what they're responding to. You know, that's like the next right underneath a staff assault. I feel like, you know, that's like the most important thing too. A scary situation in the prison. You got an inmate trying to escape. That's up there too, because the top, like the number one thing in our job is, you know, making sure the, uh, the security and safety of the institution is not impeded by any means, you know? How can that be impeded if an inmate tries to escape? You see an inmate, you know, on the rec yard, they book it for the fence. They start trying to climb over the fence. You know, I've had, we've had situations at my prison where an inmate, they were able to climb over the fence they made it through the barbed bar. wire. There's like two fences, right? You got the first fence. It's like probably 15 feet high with barbed wire. Then you got another fence, you know, and there's barbed wire in between. If they were to climb over the first fence and jump down, there's a second fence. That's that barbed bar wire in there. There's been instances at my job where an inmate was able to get over the first uh, fence and they were running in between the fences. The officer that was like the rover, that was the patrol truck. I think one instance he ended up firing around, you know, outside in the uh the patrol trucks were armed, you know. That's why we have to go uh shoot and qualify with the guns. Outside in the patrol truck, you're armed with like a pistol, probably a rifle, a assault rifle, you know. So the officer ended up firing the warning around and uh that made the inmate get on the ground to uh staff members that were responding were able to get into the fence and get them get them in cuffs and get them back inside the institution, you know? That's a scary situation, you know? Because think, if an inmate gets out, they get outside of the fence, you working in the patrol truck, right? And they coming at you. They coming at you. You got a split second decision to make, uh, make a decision what you're going to do. You know, they may have a knife on them. They may not be trying to go back inside that wall. They said they're not going back to prison. You know, they may have outside help. They may, one of their buddies may be waiting for them in the truck. You know, he got a gun. You know, they coming at you. They like, nah, you got to make a split, set, uh, split second decision, you know. That's why they ask you when you go on through the interview, you know, especially with the Bureau of Prisons. I remember when I went through my interview for them, they ask you, uh, if need be, can you take a human life, you know. Can you take a human life if it comes down to it, you know. There are certain situations you know, where you may be required to take a human life, you know? What I mean by that is having to whip out your uh, your service, the gun that they provide you if you're working a patrol truck and having a fire center mask. If he's coming at you, if they're a lethal threat, they pose a deadly or imminent threat, you know, stuff like that, you have to make that split second decision, you know? And it happens like it can go from zero to 100, you know what I'm saying? Another thing uh, I've seen, man, scary situation is mentally health inmates, man, tripping out, you know, depending on the institution you go to, you know, you may deal with uh, mentally health inmates. The prison I'm at now, we have a whole part of the prison that's dedicated just for mental health inmates. And I, when I tell you, I'll be wondering sometimes, like, where the hell do they find these people at on the street? Because it's like some of the things that they do in their when they're not taking their medication, it's like bizarre. The craziest thing I've seen with a, a mental health inmate by far is in the mental health lockup unit, we had to go in there and we had to do a cell extraction where basically you get a team of like five officers. We had to put on like the riot gear, you know, like the helmet, the elbow pads, the knee pads, gloves, uh, all, all the protective gear, you know, for like a riot break shot. You see people like, on the streets when they're like the Capitol Police. Y'all remember like when there's a riot, they got all that gear on. We have to put all that on. We have to go in the cell and we have to forcibly 
take the inmate and remove the inmate from the cell. This particular inmate that I'm talking about, I, I believe he stopped taking his medication. So the psychologist, they ordered him to be forced medicated. So we basically have to go in there and we have to hold him down while the nurse comes in with a shot and they give him a shot and injection real quick. Then, you know, we have to back out, you know, and lock the door back as quickly and as safely as possible. Now, I've had to fight inmates, man. I'm talking about they're not in their right mind. They got superhuman strength, man. It's crazy. You know, I remember there was an inmate we were fighting. You know, he was from like the Middle East. He was in there, I think, for like terrorist charge, international terrorism or something. We were trying, we had to force medicate him. We were trying to hold him down. He probably went but a damn buck, 150, maybe 160 pounds. He was mad. It took all of us to hold us down. There was some big dudes on the team, including myself. He in there, man, fighting. He was screaming some kind of Eric language. Like, I don't know if he was chanting some kind of prayer, religion. I don't know what it was. It was a crazy ass situation, man. But we held him down. The nurse came in there, boom, gave him a shot. And it was like literally like two minutes later, he fell asleep. Like the medication was powerful. Those anti-psychotic uh, medications, the doctors subscribe in the prison is some powerful stuff. But back to the story though, with this particular inmate, man, we get to the door. We've been to go in there. You know, I'm like the number four man on the team. We got to line up in a straight line. And you know, as soon as the lieutenant or sergeant opens the door, boom, we rush in there. He's like the number one man. He got a shield to try to pin the inmate up wherever he's at. The number two and three men are in charge of like, grabbing the inmate's arms, each arm. The number four and five men are in charge of grabbing the leg. So before we even get there, we get to the door. Before the lieutenant even uh, popped the door, I just happened, so I happened to peek around and look at his cell door, you know. And he was covered from head to toe. And y'all know what? He took his feces out the toilet he was standing there butt naked and it looked like he smeared feces all over his body like he was putting sunscreen on. And he was just standing there just looking at us, you know. So only thing in my head is like, yo, if we have to fight this dude and I get shit on me, I'm going I'm going to first I'm going to change. I'm going to throw all my shit out, all my, my uniform, whatever got shit on it. I'm going to grab maybe an inmate T-shirt from the laundry room or something, something I could wear out the institution, you know. And I'm going to tell the lieutenant or supervisor, I'm going home for the rest of the day. And I'm probably not coming back tomorrow. Just go ahead and put me down for sick leave. I'm not, if I get shit on me, you know. Luckily, he didn't fight. Like I said, I was the number four man on the team. I didn't even have to put hands on him. The number one and the number two man, they had gloves on, of course. They grabbed him and we marched him straight to the shower. Threw his funky is in the shower and turned the water on. Probably needed to get some bleach and spray it in there, man. It was filthy. It was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen, man. Covered from head to toe and shit. I couldn't believe it, man. You know, that's a, that's another scary situation when you deal with these med, uh, mental health inmates because for the simple fact that when they stop taking their meds or they hear like a voice in their head, you don't know what they could do, man. We've had officers get assaulted. We had a mental health inmate try to rape a nurse on the unit before. All kind of crazy bizarre stuff, man. Trying to bust out the uh, cell door to the window with their head. Boom, boom. You know that glass in the cell door is like this thick. You know, dude had. It. I've seen mental health inmates swallow razors, swallow needles, sticking stuff up there. You know what? Uh, the number where you take the number one or do the number two in the bathroom. I've seen inmates sticking stuff up those areas, man. Just to go. It's crazy. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, the nut, the net, the last thing I want to leave y'all with, man, that's as far as scary situation. This is happening a lot here lately. Is inmates that are getting intoxicated, they're getting high off of drugs. This is becoming an epidemic inside the prison system. It's getting out of hand. This shit is getting crazy. If you're coming into corrections, man, be safe. Don't never try to deal with these inmates one on one because you don't know what they're capable of. You don't know what they can do when they're high off of these drugs. You know they're getting, they're get, it's getting to the point where they're taking rat poison, right? or they're taking household chemicals, industrial chemicals, and they're either smoking it or sniffing it somehow, and they're getting high. I just did a video about this a couple days ago talking about how the drug use problem in prisons is it's becoming an epidemic, man. It's getting out of hand. It's like when I stay over and work overtime on a day shift, it's like almost daily, so an officer is calling for the compound officer or the yard officer to come over to their unit because they have an inmate that appears intoxicated, you know? And it's like you get there and they're slurring or they're just not in their right, they're in their right mind state, you know. So 
you had to practice safety first dealing with those type of inmates. You know, there's a lot of different scary situations. Like I said, you may encounter within the prison system, a riot, a natural disaster. You live somewhere like Miami, a hurricane touched through. You got to re uh, evacuate all of the prisoners. A flood can come through. Anything can happen. You know, just always be alert. Always stay safe, you know, always go by the policy as much as possible, you know, and expect anything because you never know what can happen working inside of a prison. I thought, I think, I feel like I've seen it all in my career, but I'm surprised every day I see something new, man. Damn near, you know, it's, it, it, it takes me by surprise. I'm like, wow, I can't believe this shit really happened. Y'all like this video, make sure you subscribe to my channel at the Ghetto Body Butter. Follow me on Instagram, TikTok at the Ghetto Body Butter. I got merchandise for sale. Shop with me on my website www.theghettobodybutter.com and but yeah, those are just a few of the things scary situations or encounters that you're going to deal with working in corrections you know and like i said it can happen at any level from camp all the way to a high security max custody penitentiary you never know what could go down you know you could be working at a camp where nothing happens all of a sudden an uh, inmate uh, crazed gunman comes in there and starts shooting shit up man you just never know man you know y'all got any comments questions or concerns drop or you got any uh ideas for future videos or topics y'all want me to cover in future videos drop a comment and i'll get back to you as soon as i can y'all know how we coming let's get motivated boop